Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Parallel, Curating Structural Change. Uh, most of you know me, but for those who don't, my name's Bianca Hester, and I'm the co-director of research and engagement for the School of Art and Design uh, with my colleague, Oliver Bown, who can't be here today, unfortunately, due to being on study leave overseas. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathering today upon unceded sovereign lands. We're all on different lands, so if you could please uh, put those in the chat, that would be great. Uh, through the institution of UNSW, I'm acknowledging that the land, water and sky upon which that institution stands is unceded land and pay respects to Gadigal and Bidigal custodians, past, present and emerging, who have nurtured the place for millennia. We meet here in acknowledgement that this is a site of innovation and creativity for thousands and thousands of years and that we are the beneficiaries of their care and custodianship. We are indebted and grateful to First Nations friends and colleagues who generously share knowledges, processes and activism in the shaping and reshaping of the culture of the school. I'm also acknowledging that in being on these lands, particularly through the framework of this institution, is the direct product of invasion and is a part of a colonial continuum at a deeply structural level which many of us are complicit in. Therefore, acknowledgements are not enough, and I ask us all to deepen our own critical engagements with the work of cultural reflexivity in an ongoing way, alongside listening to and centering Aboriginal leadership, methodologies, knowledges and people across the layers, the various layers of teaching, organisational and research practice that is taking place within this institution and to commit to contributing to developing safer spaces for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the School of Art and Design and UNSW as a whole. So this series of forums is developed in collaboration with the School Research Committee, uh, and Veronica is on that committee, and is led by key researchers in the school who curate forums in relationship to their current research concerns and projects. So it's with really great pleasure and warmth um, on behalf of the School of Art and Design, that I welcome the Parallel Structures Project, led by Veronica, with a team of curatorial oh, fellows who are critically exploring, are critically exploring new ways to think and feel structural change through art institutions. I welcome the team to introduce the fellows and give a brief background to the project. Thank you so much for joining us curatorial fellows and audience and uh, just the basic general housekeeping I'm gonna mute ying hi, hi ying <laughs> um it's good to see you here uh mics off please questions in the in the chat and we'll open it up to q a um and dialogue at the end of the session so i'll hand it over to you parallel thank you um, Bianca. So um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Tupi people and um, Salodi Tawali and I will be co-chairing today. Um, Salodi has disappeared from my screen. I'm are you right there, Salodi? Yeah, are they, yeah, they are. Yeah. Sorry, it's panicking. <laughs> um, anyway, so Salodi and I wanted to start just by giving you a very brief introduction to Parallel and why we initiated the project. Um, and so maybe we could start with um, some photos uh, from um, Mama. And these are not projects that Salodi and I developed. They're projects that Mama developed, but I guess it gives you a sense of the history out of which Parallel comes from. So um, just briefly, and so let you feel free to intervene at any point. Um, in 2016, I think it was, Salotti, you won the New South Wales Mid-Career and Established Fellowship Award. Maybe you can speak to that since you probably remember the details. Oh, uh, yes. Of the year. Part of the award was um, a residency and in a regional art uh, museum. It was between, I think, Tweed Heads and Mar Mama. Um, and I have family down just 40 minutes out of Mama and it's sort of the border between Victoria and New South Wales that have been to like places of home for me. So I chose there and uh, Veronica and 
uh, had invited me to be a part of a research group um, between, oh, I can't remember where, Veronica, was it like King's College? Arizona and King's College. Yeah. Arizona and, and King's College. And there was some funding there and we uh, decided to do a project together. And, uh, you know, because, and we went down to Mama, I was there for my residency. I was making work for another show. We went down there to... um to uh like work on something with mama and i'd approached brie at the time who was the director there and asked if you know that mama would be interested in maybe doing a project that introduced um people from the area like uh um refugees and immigrants from the area to the museum who maybe already didn't have that connection and Brie introduced us to, um, oh, now I'm forgetting that. Nevanka. Nevanka. Nevanka, who had, like, started a project, the, the um, community. Multicultural Youth Club, Multicultural Aubrey Wodonga. Yeah, yeah. And so we decided to invite them to come and do a tour of the museum, and that included uh, the back end and the front end. So we were going to go and look in the collections, and then uh, do a workshop in an exhibition, and then uh, and then at the end of that, ask them if they wanted to continue that connection with the organisation because we knew that we'd be leaving. And but Mama was interested. Navanka really wanted to make a connection with um, the museum, and so we did at that day. It was a really um, lovely day. And then, then of course, we we flew home. I finished my residency, but um, you know the museum. And I think you're here today, Sophie. Worked very hard for two years on uh, the Culture Connect program with uh, people who lived in the area. Yeah. So I think that um, I think it's. It's kind of been, um, well, that was um, 2017, I think it was. So it's been a long-term dialogue. And Sophie Holvest, who is um, here today and works in engagement at the museum, and also Nanette Orley, who's a curator at the museum, and Annie Folk and Brie Pickering and Mike Moran and others have um, been in dialogue with us over many years um, and doing their own initiatives, like uh, Sunday Art Chat, um, and they were also willing to participate in Parallel, which sought to, I guess, following a more um, uh, experiments with engagement, um, which Sophie and Annie and others have been pursuing, we were also interested to look at um, the, the the relationship between the front and the back end in a, in a different way. And so we initiated parallel um, structures, looking at the ways in which curating and curating in a kind of fairly expanded form, which can include dialogical projects, um, behind the scenes, uh, non-exhibition based projects, um, can start to rethink the ways in which the operations, the administration, the processes um, of the museum uh, as a whole, given that the museum's um, one of its foremost priorities is to curate and exhibit and take care of collections, artworks, people's communities, uh, infrastructure of all kinds, um, can yield different ways of, of thinking of what the role of a museum is within a settler colonial context, but also very specifically within um, a regional context and um, and Auburu Odonga. And I think as Salotti's already acknowledged, we all don't live in, in Auburu Odonga. And I think that these questions of um, belonging and being from are obviously very fraught coming from a settler colonial and diasporic perspective as well. So these are topics that are at the center of the parallel research and at the center of what mum is doing. Um, and at the centre of what the fellows will be talking about today as I, well. So, yeah. I also think, like, you know, we wanted to, in the, as our project moved into parallel, is acknowledge that also the that audience at Mama, like people that have that come to live there from overseas and then um, 
are actually a moving community and not everyone stays. And so mm. part of looking at the structures too was like, you know, looking at who's creating the back end and what's, and, and Mama, I, I just want to acknowledge that Mama was just a really great choice because they're already thinking about that themselves. Exactly. So the, 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 the bar's already set, I think, quite high and there's been, I think ho hopefully um, for everyone involved and so if you perhaps you could chime in in the Q&A, um, you know, a, a knowledge exchange with maybe uneven forms of knowledge, but that um, can, you know, together cross-pollinate and, and develop sometimes tension perhaps um, and difference, but um, within that a generative dialogue. Um, yeah, so I think if it's not already clear, um, I think it was kind of implicit in some of the things Saladi and I said, but Aubrey Wodonga is um, one of the satellite settlement cities, um, designated satellite settlement cities for uh, refugees and, and um, migrants, especially from the global south. Um, and so, therefore, its um, highest uh, growing population is of uh, refugee and migrant populations from the global south. And that's why we wanted to take this approach and, and rethink the role of the museum from a position that is also diasporic, which is as represented from um, by the curatorial fellows that we'll speak today. So I guess like we can kind of jump into the talk now and um, maybe just show you some cute uh, pictures while I just tell you the structure. So this is a photo from our February intensive with the Parallel Curatorial Fellows. Um, at the Brutonized Community Farm, which has become um, the site for Lana and Seb's project, Sebastian Henry Jones, so Lana Nguyen. Sebastian Henry Jones is missing in this picture because he, he got COVID during the intensive, um, but he's here today. We should have and... photoed him in with like a pillow and like a, a tissue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I, um, and before we move in, I also just wanted to acknowledge that part of what Parallel is broadly doing, um, so Parallel is more than just, um, I guess, the curatorial projects at MAMA, it's also a writing, um, a critical writing project that we've developed in collaboration with Runway Journal, and I know some Runway people are here today, so thanks Joe and um, Sarah and others, if, if I haven't seen you, sorry, um, for coming today. And so through that runway collaboration, we've um, commissioned a series of texts that um, are looking at questions central to parallel. So ideas of structural change um, from diasporic and First Nations peoples, but also in relation to regional um, Australia. So We've released three of the commissions so far and the next three um, are coming out soon and then some other new commissions will be announced soon too. So, um, okay, so so today um, we've got the six uh, fellows, uh, curatorial fellows speaking, and we've kind of uh, developed a structure with just three sections. And the first section is entitled The Detail of Structural Change, where we'll be um, asking two of the fellows to talk to the idea of what structural change is, how that concept has changed perhaps through this project. Then the second section, there'll be another two fellows um, talking about the politics of location, what it means to work on site in a regional context, um, in a settler colonial context. Um, and then the third section is called back end, front end, and it looks at the relationship between community engagement and working on structural change, which is obviously often an admin um, heavy process or a process that looks at the often invisible ways in which museums operate. So, so we just starting, oh, yeah. yeah, let's just jump in. Take it away, Salati. Okay, so just jumping in then. Um, this is for Ruha and Jenny. Um, what is structural change for you? And, and has that changed? I guess I want to know in this kind of when you're discussing this, from the way you thought of what was your concept at the beginning of this project and then um, through, like, has there been a learning approach 
um, that has maybe uh, changed your perception of that a little or not? Uh, be great, would be great to know. So just some context, Ruha is going to talk first, I think, and she's in the back of a van, not planned. <laughs> she's safe, don't worry. <laughs> Yeah, she hasn't in the middle of a kidnapping. <laughs> she will make sure that she can hang yes. out uh, on this panel. But yeah, <laughs> how are you going, Ruha? Yeah, going good. It's, I mean, how amazing we can be on the road enjoying these types of discussions. <laughs> um, and just to acknowledge that I'm in Taranaki in Aotearoa um, with some amazing artists where I'm sure you I can turn my screen around. We're in the, the wake of the um, Maunga here, Maunga Taranaki, which just has just achieved the status of personhood legally. So it's a real kind of special place to be um, on this land, but otherwise live and work in um, in Yagambe country uh, in Queensland. And I know that these places really influence the way that I think and engage um, in projects like this. So. Yeah, no doubt, you know, inform kind of the way we're thinking. Also, just wanted to acknowledge that at this time in this project, kind of coming into uh, being able to articulate to a to a unique audience what we're thinking and what we've learned along the way is such a helpful tool. And to be able to reconnect with these other fellows and um, it, you know, kind of appreciate the ways that our thinking has fed into each other's um, growth then. Well, I think is really special. Uh, we've had, yeah, it's really been a beautiful relationship. And I think we're kind of coming into the space knowing that so much has been done in between. And I think it's a really precious time for us to just to hear about and find those synergies. So grateful to be here um, in that context and to be able to speak with Jenny to this to these questions. It's there, it's weird, we kind of <laughs> want Jenny to speak too. <laughs> I think I just <laughs> should we bounce back and forward. I can maybe come in now as well. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I guess, um, yeah, before I begin, I, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking on the unceded lands of Bajigal and Gadigal people and pay my respects um, to elders past and present and that a lot of this thinking was um, really shaped by a lot of the research and um, travelling that I did um, in Aubrey Wodonga, which is on the um, Wiradjuri land, so I want to pay my respects um, to others there as well um yeah I just want to like echo what Ruha was saying as well and we had the like um I guess the, the privilege of like being able to cross paths um again really recently and we connected over a lot of these ideas again but um yeah as Ruha was saying so many of our projects are informed by the others um and we did start working really closely together and uh, due to time and um just operating in different cities in different parts of this country, we've kind of drifted apart a little bit, but so many of um, elements of at least my project definitely are informed by thinking that we've all kind of collectively generated um, together through this parallel process, which is now like coming up to almost like a year and a half, I want to say, um, which is wild, but um, Jenny, has should I answer the question? <laughs> Can I maybe, because uh, uh, I think I asked all the mm. questions at once for your section. Which <laughs> I really did. But I guess uh, when you came in, because uh, when you guys came in, you didn't, everyone didn't know each other. Um, what we do, you, did your ideas of what it meant to be in a, a part of a project of structural change, what was that when you were coming in to the project? Um, it was like it was terrifying, and I think um, operating as a cohort really helped soften that experience. And we, I mean, it, it was we we're really grateful that we all gelled um, together, and we were um, problematizing um, the same things and um, wanting to investigate um, kind of very similar things, but but through very different methodologies because we all have very different practices. So. I think yeah, coming into the experience was quite daunting. Like these are incredibly challenging questions to answer, especially as we all kind of straddle mostly the kind of more emerging side of, of professional practice. Um, so I think being able to learn from each other um, was really helpful. And also just to have that kind of very like both formal and informal um, network of, of support and, and care. Um, we were, I mean, there was incredible support 
um, in, you know, at times obviously administered through um, MAMA, the institution, and then also Parallel, which you are also an institution to some degree, but um, kind of sitting at the intersection of that, um, I think, yeah, operating as a cohort just really helped that process. I kind of, because all of you were chosen because of um, the projects that you had already made, your proposal process. And so to to some degree, you were all working um, with structural change in mind in previous projects. So I, I imagine saying, hey, we're going to do this structural change, pro like uh, just as part of your practice, but saying, hey, we're going to do this structural change project could have been quite daunting and... Sorry. Sorry. Um, so like has like working through like, I mean, is it too much to ask maybe particular kind of uh, like the way you thought you might come in and work in the museum? Did it, has your project changed a lot from your initial kind of ideas? And maybe you'd talk to your project a bit, that'll help. I think I was talking to you, Jenny. Yeah. Oh, to me, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, just kind of being on the on the tail end of this, not tail end, but really, um, you know, having the rubber hit the road now. Um, I've been reflecting on thing and, and, and what um, I had sort of initially proposed, and then it's incredibly similar. Um, I'll just wait for... Um, yeah, initially, and to kind of also go back to your question before, I was um, <clears throat> looking to kind of unpick or trouble the, and apologies, I've got quite a terrible cold. Um, so if I sound a bit congested, that's why. But I was looking at um, what we inherit um, in terms of the, the legacies and the structures um, within institutions and how to kind of unsettle um, notions of neutrality. I think, you know, it, also working in a, quite a large institution myself, like we, we boast, um, that we're moving forward in, in quite progressive kind of ways and that we operate as like civic spaces, but there's still um, so much that we need to trouble, even the architectural kind of like makeup of the institutions um, have a, a kind of um, adorn very specific histories and, and legacies and um, reflect certain um, histories or exclude many in the process. So I was interested in, um, I guess, commissioning um, a work that troubled that and and kind of um I guess was um adopted different kind of um structures ones that are malleable ones that are relational ones that can hold stories and narratives within them um that are in you know in flux and can grow with um the kind of the institution's diverse constituents so the kind of yeah the desire to sort of um commission something has remained so I'm I'm very grateful to be working with the amazing artist Keg de Caesar, who is on the call today. Hi, Keg. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in that process of kind of thinking um, about these really broad questions of structural change and, and what it means to enact those within the context of MAMA and within the broader kind of premise of parallel, um, I think that's been really um yeah, really interesting and, and really challenging at the same time and really fruitful. Um, had to get really specific with a lot of the questions um, that we were, that I was at least initially asking. Um, and the bottom line kind of came down to what um, resources are sort of um, readily available. Um, does that, yeah, I think there's something else I wanted to say. Another, actually another kind of key um, point in that was a lot of that thinking departed from like site specificity and um, and with that, not just like Aubrey Madonga serving as Veronica alluded to a kind of this um, migrant resettlement um, kind of um, space, primarily in like the post-war periods, but also MAMA um, as like it's building having housed the Crown's Lands office. So um, being responsible for the colonial management of, of land um, for quite some time. So again, thinking about what the space um, has kind of inherited and what its use has has been over the years and what it's, um, yeah, what kind of acts um, it has performed within it. So I think I was really like wanting to engage in that um, site specificity and in that context, um, but a lot has pivoted 
um, due to so many yeah, material constraints and just, I don't know, people are, are really tired um, and doing a project on structural change takes a lot of um, concerted effort. Um, but yeah, so the, the focus on the relational structures has, um, I've really had to embrace that. Um, and now I think the, the commission is really focusing on, um, well, it really like hinges on this, like one um, person. So again, like coming back into thinking about alternative structures, but ones that are relational and um, really site specific, but um, like person specific, I guess, um, and honoring, um, yeah, the nuances that that exist um, within those, you know, very intimate relations um, in that space in Aubrey Wodonga. Um, does that, yeah. maybe Ruha, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, because also I think you, um, you've kind of moved, like you said, you said that you moved from like back, moved around and back to the kind of project that you had originally thought you would make. Ruha, I think you've been quite similar in that, right? Have you, like, what were you think? where did you want to focus your project on the structural change initially? And it does seem to be in the same place now as it was before, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, I think the main shift is you kind of have theories, but, you know, the context is going to inform so much of how you, how that plays out. Um, I think the nature of our project is something that came up initially when we were together in February that really stood out for me is, you know, often and kind of ingrained into a way of working over a long period of time. And, um, you know, they, some may be, you know, how do you, how do you kind of uh, instigate or involve yourself? What is your role to participate in kind of sustainable structural change? as someone coming into a place that's new, um, only being able to spend limited time there. Um, your networks and relationships are also, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, restricted. And I guess it was really lucky to be in a place where mama themselves were also critically analyzing their own structures and seeking um, to expand their ways of thinking and to kind of consider that, uh, you know, it wasn't about coming and achieving the structural change that's going to be in place for <laughs> time to come that wasn't necessarily I guess my uh, perception of what success in the project is was about um, being able to figure out what contribution can you make to um, and you know where the uh, to something that will need many people and much time to kind of follow through and maybe see more um, the results so I guess finding that balance of designing something that maybe has a you know it was um goals you're setting for your project <laughs> and like what are the goals that are going to mean something in the in the grander scheme of things the, the journey of this institution um really be able to be woven in uh, and I guess yeah maybe what's it uh some just to speak to this random slide that's been sitting there for so long. <laughs> you guys said how, but um, <laughs> I think one of the things was looking at just even the difference between structures and it's come up recently in um, chats with Jenny as well. And it's this idea that, you know, depending on the purpose we see for an institution, the institutions, I kind of found it helpful always to think of these different um, entities that make up a society being, you know, there are individuals who have certain powers, certain sense of responsibility, um, certain things, you know, the ability to take individual initiative to kind of act in a particular way, communities that within themselves also had, you know, cultures exist in that space and ways of working um, that enable them to be able to work in ways unique to that entity. And then institutions, you know, have a particular kind of uh, characteristics that allow them also to contribute to the society in particular ways. And so kind of understanding that, but also the relationships between them has been something that's really been a question on my mind going in. Um, and that depending on the purpose that that, that guides those relationships, uh, you can either build structures that are very mechanical, kind of transactional, there to achieve certain tasks, or you can build systems that have the ability to grow, to learn, to adapt and overcome challenges through 
consultations. And so a big, a big part of my question was how, how do you build, you know, it's also a spectrum. It's how do we make our structures, how do we build capacity in our institutions that have structures that are um, able to change and evolve and have that agility and have, um, are able to do that, not with audience, you know, not with artists and community just being participants in the things we set, but are really protagonists of that process as well and share in that purpose. Um, and, and how do those kind of things exist? That with Mama. I'm just wondering, because yeah. uh, you both also work for quite big organisations as well as par like working in parallel and like, it, it, what about how these things work without you being there? Like, are you, because when you're talking about people and specific, um, I guess, specific powers and also like you know what an institution wants to be seen as or um how they operate is like um is it possible to affect those changes when you're for when you're gone is also a question I I think about when I hear you talk like that mm. yeah I think it's about building systems and sometimes our interaction with people who do come from different cultures or different ways of thinking allow us to become more conscious of what <laughs> what we do have in place already and and that there are possibilities for it to look different I think that's would be um, one of the things is just to offer a different perspective not that it has to be something that's pulling someone in that but it's just how do we make space to continue perspectives and, and uh, you know, and greater clarity about our direction, about where we're at, filter through and accept what's useful for us to now get from where we are to a stronger point uh, in that process. I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe to, you know, it's interesting looking at the role of the curator in that sense. Well, did anyone else lose real oh, heart in that one? Do you mind being, repeating that? Creating relationships, in a sense, alongside. Oh, am I back? Yeah. I was just uh, saying it's interesting to then think about the idea, the role of a curator in that context, um, of curating relationships almost, and thinking about uh, that can um, can be brought together to deliver processes. To the mouth that that uh, that drawn the arts and vision is for, for for a group of people for all all entities involved um, you're, you're cutting out a bit Ruha. Uh, Ruha. so maybe, maybe we'll just get Jenny to jump in but Ruha you've done amazingly from the back of a van yeah I guess approaching this through this okay okay I'll come back then Oh, I'm sorry, Ruha, it's a bit pitsy. So Ru Ruha, just because it's maybe the information was lost, is working with Mama's Raw program, which is their youth um, program. I think it's under 25? Yeah, youth, I think not... it's 25 and under. Yeah. Um, and it's an annual exhibition program. So... She's been uh, working on that project in particular, which is the sides that you're seeing. Um, but yes, anyway, maybe Jenny can speak now. Yeah, we were looking at the just what. Uh... Yeah, sorry, Ruha. <laughs> the van's done so well. Was it the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the, the internet's really too patchy. You see the landscape. Oh, okay. Is it still patchy? No, it's on. It's, now. it's working yeah. now. It's working. Should I go for it? Go for Just it. <laughs> is that role was kind of said as a space where we could really hone in on a particular segment of the community. Okay, I think, I think we'll have to cut it. that have worked it. with the guests. I'm sorry, it's... how it's like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's roll on with Jenny. So maybe Jenny, you want to speak um, more directly 
about some of the processes and people and maybe, I don't know, maybe you have departed from the concept of demonumentalizing, but that was at least a starting point. And I see you're talking about monuments, so I imagine it's still relevant. It's it's still it's still in there. Um and it, it really came back after like Keg said an amazing um uh kind of gave the, the project a description and she was like, what about a monument that's living? I was like, yes, this is this is it. Because I was using other um I was interested in relational infrastructures and thinking about structural changes um as those relational kind of structures and, and how you have to work with and through people to, to make that change um <clears throat> but yeah the, the idea of like the um how institutions are complicit in perpetualizing you know certain histories and narratives and dictate the way that we remember and erase um certain narratives in the process um so yeah i i really started with the idea of, of the monument and, and demonumentalizing and um i might just speak really quickly to and these are just some questions that were guiding my, my project um, initially and, and still kind of relevant, but but the image in the center, so this is a, a kind of a memorial monument type wall in um, the Bernicula migrant resettlement camp, which is located in Wodonga. And that's where over, um, over a quarter of a million um, people passed through um, between the, the sort of post-World War II years. And it was shut, stopped operating in 1971. So also just like quite um, insane to think about it in operation while like the white Australia policy was also still in effect. Um, anyway, there's a, there's a lot um, in this site um, and, and the history that it perpetuates and the way that Bonagula has shaped a sort of collective consciousness around migration and and whose stories get to be kind of remembered. And, and um, this wall, I think for me, did, um, was really indicative of, of who gets to be remembered. And there's a lot of, names of migrants from like southern Europe um making which sort of like end their their voyages or their journeys um in the 70s when when the when the center shut down so a lot of the, the the timeline around migration ends there so the project was kind of a way to um, articulate a continuum of these experiences as Veronica you mentioned a lot of these um migrants are now and refugees are now coming from um countries in the global south um and there's kind of no, I guess, space or, or way to sort of collectively um, talk about um, these these stories and um, this movement of people that is ongoing in the space. So yeah, monuments and, and the role that institutions play in monumentalizing was really important to begin with. Um, and then, yeah, through that, I was, I'm just gonna read maybe one of my questions, was thinking about the provocation of what might it look like if institutions were in flux and adapting to the growing needs um, of their diverse constituents. So rather than having this kind of static monolithic, um, like quite literally sort of structure, one that can evolve over time and hold those stories and, and be comprised of those stories in some way. Um, just, I wanna also quickly explain the image on the left, I was really, um, chuffed about finding this. There's a, a site called Monuments Australia. It's like this weird DIY run kind of um, research site and they have all the, the different monuments um, scattered across so-called Australia and obviously um, all have a very particular tone and, and purpose as you can imagine but I just found it interesting to kind of like sift through what is um, uh, given space to be monumentalized in, in Aubrey Wodonga um, so yeah, that's where I sort of started. And then, um, but yeah, in, in the process of, of moving through parallel and, and um, speaking to so many local stakeholders across all the different research development weeks, just found the stories of, you know, their stories just so much richer. Um, and I wanted that to directly inform um, the structure and the process in, in some way. Um, and then, yeah, as I alluded to before, when Keg was like, what about a living um, monument? Um, and, you know, Q, Keg's incredible practice that works with um, plants and and that just brought on a whole nother dimension to, to this project and thinking about um, the movement of people and across um, place and time, but also the movement of, of plants and, and how um, landscape kind of shifts um, with that and, and how so many um, 
migrants who have settled in Old Udonga and, and beyond that have kind of um, cultivated these gardens to grow um, produce and food from back home, which, which are really hard to access otherwise. So um, thinking about those spaces is, is they're, the, they're the monuments, you know. Um, so yeah, Keg's been really instrumental in, in shifting that, that thinking. Just sort of question from Tian. I think also we need to, we're out of time for this section, Bianca says, but um, we can come back to these questions um, at the end. And I think this is your drawing. But so I guess, um, thank you, Jenny and Van Ruha, Ruha Van Ruha. And um, yeah, and, and just reflecting back on, you know, the detail of structural change, I think it's hard to get to the detail is, um, part of I think what we've discovered in this project but through methods of um, relationality and I think thinking on on those in those in interpersonal forms of of working through what an institution is so it is it is living it's social it's um it's also I guess trying to think of the building or monuments or ar architectures like the museum has been also living and being a, not static, something that can be um, transformed even temporarily through these processes. So um, I think we'll move on to the next section, and um, which is the politics of location, by which we mean many things, um, and I won't speak to them because I guess Lana and Seb will speak to them. But so Lana and Seb, um, Lana Nguyen and Sebastian Henry Jones, for those that um, don't know them, uh, collaborating on a project. So they were selected individually, but they decided to collaborate on a project together for Parallel, and they chose to work on the Bhutanese community farm. So I guess the question for you, Seb and Lana, um, and you can speak to your project um, directly if it helps you to answer, but, I mean, let's start with just, like, the first the first layer of this question of what is the politics of location is like what um has it been like for you to work within Wiradjuri country within Wodonga in relationship to Aubrey and Mama in other words within a regional setting um and how, how have you approached working on site um yeah and we can flesh out what the politics of location means from that yeah, I guess our project is across the river. So it's not actually in Aubrey, it's in Wodonga. It's um, on contested um, territory as well. So not necessarily mm -hmm. just Wurundjeri country. Um, oh yeah, and I'm also coming from Wurundjeri country today as is Seb who is down the road a little bit. Um, and yeah, I was really interested in situating the project offsite because I think it really brings a lot of different politics of place and that's what a lot of my work is interested in. But as soon as we sort of um, dislocate the centrality of the museum, I think it becomes really interesting. Um, and that definitely comes into play in terms of timelines. Like our project has really had to move a lot of the museum's timelines according to the seasons, according to how hot it is outside, according to, you know, when there are community festivals because we're working with a particular, um, particular communities at the farm as well. And that doesn't necessarily work within um, the schedules that Mama sets. Um, I think also, yeah, we we're really interested in putting it off site to sort of trouble the thing of audience engagement, always bringing um, people into the museum. Like what is it for the museum to move towards the people that they are interested in working with rather than trying to envelop them within the structure that already exists. And for me, that feels a lot more generous. So do you have some initial ideas? Yeah. I mean, just, uh, I'm also on Wurundjeri country as, as Lana said. Um, but yeah, just for a little bit of context, we were originally working on two discrete projects. So while Lana was wanting to situate a project at the Bhutanese community farm um, offsite, I was also wanting to situate a project um, offsite in a sense, but one that existed between the relationships of local artists living in the region. 
so I guess kind of sharing our projects with each other, we realized that we were both interested in thinking about how um, the museum can support culture or significant cultural activity that's already happening rather than, um, you know, capturing or reproducing it, um, you know, through discursive programming. Um, so yeah, our, our project is, is thinking about bringing this group of local artists to the Bhutanese community garden to, um, yeah, to engage with each other within a kind of pedagogical framework. I mean, the Bhutanese garden supports dozens of Bhutanese families and in recent years, Congolese families. They're growing ingredients that they can't necessarily buy at the, the supermarket. They're sharing recipes and language. And when you go there, it's like, wow, this is really culturally significant. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of situating our project offsite has been about, um, yeah, not only like redirecting like the flow of yeah, like energy and currency um, away from the museum, but kind of expanding the work that it already does. So, for example, like um, an institutional understanding of care, which often um, is read through the lens of conservation, um, whereby objects are looked after for in this kind of hermetically sealed um, environment by situating the project outside. Um, yeah, allows an expansion of that understanding to maybe incorporate living things um, and, you know, to kind of think about um, how a museum might care for country. And in doing so, you start kind of expanding the responsibilities of, um, of institutions. Yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say for now, but yeah. Interesting working across the um, state divide. I think our project is in Wodonga, which probably has a bit of a class difference to Aubrey, and that's Aubrey is where most of the museum staff live. I um, or the, who who I know anyway. Um, and it's been really interesting, sort of, because Aubrey Wodonga twin cities across, and we're in the Victorian side, and often we'll just go over to the New South Wales side. But in terms of getting funding, that's been a really complicated um, process as well. And I think that's also speaks to us coming in from the city, also into this space, and um, moving across those borders. Yeah, I think there's lots to explore there. And I guess I'm interested in. Like following that thinking, like how have how you have both, I guess, um, positioned yourselves in that space. Like in terms of like how do you talk about yourselves and like what your project is, and um, I guess generate like an interest in that project. It, it has that? I mean, because you're working with different kinds of community groups like the farm the farmers um, that are part of the Bhutanese farm and then there's um, artists who may also be farmers but not necessarily at the Bhutanese farm um, and there's I guess in this project all of us from that parallel are very aware of um, the fact that you know the politics of location as I said at the start is very fraught and so but nonetheless we all situate ourselves and um, come from a, a space of wanting to um, as you said be generous but also I think be self-reflexive of the limitations of um, the positions or perspectives that we have and I know your project's also very much about listening and learning and letting that process lead so I think you kind of know what I'm getting at, if that's, yeah, okay. There's not really a question, clear question there, but I think you get you get the vibe. I mean, we've, ha we've had to do a lot of disguise work in our, like, grant work, for example, by, you know, relating to different groups. We've had to apply under Victorian organisation and then a New South Wales organisation or all these different things. And I think because we're in this really liminal space, it's really forcing this sense of relationality, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, yeah. Did you have anything for... Veronica's non-question, so? Yeah, it made, uh, while Veronica was speaking, I was just thinking about, yeah, like the the initial time that I came to Albury-Wodonga was 
really important. Um, Mama, the staff at Mama um, kind of introduced me to a lot of local artists. We had a really nice conversation about their experiences of, as being artists in a regional location, their relationship with the museum. Um, and it's kind of just going from there. Um, so I already had a relationship with one artist who we eventually have worked with um, from a project in Canberra. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, just kind of being open to like you meet one person and then they introduce you to someone else and you kind of like um, engage with those moments and experiences in a very resourceful way. So I don't know, for me in that sense, the project has kind of grown organically. I don't know if I'm answering your question, B. Are there well, people there was no question, involved? Seb. <laughs> there, was a, there was a sort of not question. Are, are there people involved from your initial project proposal in this new one that you're working with Alana? Yeah, there are. So, um, yeah, the, the, the artists that we uh, have ended up working with, I think two of them, no, three of them I met in this initial um, meeting. So that's Ashley Lang, um, Susie Loesch and Glennis Briggs. And they're all um, local artists in inverted commas because living locally in um, a regional context might mean that you live like an hour's drive away. Um, but in kind of getting to know them in their practices a little bit more, um, we've discovered that like, you know, Susie, for example, has this amazing garden at her house and like a very a keen, interesting gardening. Um, in the time since I've met him, Ash has begun working as a curator at Wangaratta Gallery. Um, so all these, I guess, like, yeah, uh, expanding our working relationship with these people to in, involve not just like what their artistic practice is has really um, informed the project itself. Which is really sense. important, I think, because I think there's a cultural idea of art that comes from a museum and I think our project's trying to expand what um, art and culture can be seen as and that's particularly why we're interested in working with a culturally significant place like the farm and with farmers and, like, working with those different types of um, skill sets that maybe aren't classically defined as art in, like, the Western canon. I think a lot of our project also is about um, giving the space for people to learn from each other who are already close close by and I think we were looking at a lot of the um, education programs at MAMA and seeing that they were sort of you know a, an expert artist and like a paid cohort of people who were learning you know like how to paint or how to do photography like the expert artist like work that's already in the collection and so this was a a, a, a different space of giving people I guess um, empowering them with what they already know and allowing them to teach each other like between the local artists but also between the farmers and the artists and also between the farmers themselves giving them um, the opportunity to do that as well. Yeah I guess um, I'm also just thinking I mean it's a one of the questions we wanted to ask you which is quite broad but at least it's a question um it's like what have been some of the challenges that you've experienced like with the in in relation I mean the challenges are many I am sure um but maybe more specifically in relationship to um I guess implementing your specific idea of of structural change like you've already mentioned expanding ideas of of conservation and and wanting to work off-site to expand the idea of um, the space of culture. Um, so if you could speak to some of those of challenges working on the farm. Yeah, I guess um, I think something all the fellows would have experienced is just the distance from like where we're all living to where our projects are taking place. Um, that's had really big implications for the way that Lana and I have been able to, you know, make plans and organize our time, you know, specifically working at the Bhutanese garden. Um, 
it's not like the museum when you know someone's going to be there between a Monday and a, a Friday. It's, um, yeah, quite literally um, connected to the weather, um, the seasons, um, what are, what else people have going on in, in their lives in a very explicit way. Um, yeah, so that's obviously been a really big challenge. Something that I've found challenging is like really um, trying to get to the heart of like what art means in a regional context. And Lana touched on it a little bit before, but um, I found that there is um, an understanding about art or fine art um, in Albira Dongra at least that understands, recognizes like painting and sculpture as something that is, um, you know, legible as, as art. Um, and kind of figuring out whether that is something that is an expectation of local audiences or whether that's like an assumption of local audience that is held by the museum has been really challenging. And I don't know if I spent enough time um, in the context of Orbi Wadonga or whether I've met enough people to really come to an, an answer with that. Um, but I'm hoping that our project can kind of unpack some of those um, questions for me. Yeah. And I guess maybe it's worth saying that your project is um, developed in collaboration with with the farm and then five artists that will, it's a kind of like a project that has been happening already for almost a year, I think. And in March, it culminates in a five-day kind of school, basically, isn't it? Yeah. In March uh, 7, doesn't it's kind of the exhibition day, isn't it, at the farm? I also just wanted to say one of the challenges for our project was the um, some of the structures at MAMA in terms of exhibitions and public programs. As soon as something moves outside of the gallery space and is, you know, exhibited in like not a typical exhibition way, it gets half the amount of funding. And so partially why we combined our projects was to be able to <laughs> have that amount of um, resources to make something feel really significant outside of the exhibition space. It's it's like a sort of um, bias in the system that actually biases a particular way of interacting with art and looking and a particular mode of art, which is very object-based. And so we've really tried to um, move against that, I guess. And um, that's been a tricky thing. And I guess we've we've worked in our structure to try and, and shift that, but it was definitely a challenge. And I think it's going to be a challenge if the museum and continually like art institutions want to work with diverse communities like they're going to have to change the way that they're working not only allowing people in I think it's a very colonial way of um, thinking to just like assimilate into what is already happening rather than actually bending and negotiating and talking about the needs of um, the people that you're trying to relate to and so part of our project is also like asking about the reciprocal nature of those interactions instead of you know the museum just being this bastion of um culture that's collected in this um you know yeah weird storage place like can it also feed like living um communities and cultures that actually generate that yeah i mean yeah so i guess lana I guess you're talking about too like like the fee structures and how they're set and they even like exist beyond how the museum, like that's not just set by the museum, isn't it? It's like set by funders and funding. Like really when we talk about structures, we look, we're also talking beyond the museum. Yeah, definitely. And those, you know, it, public programs have, often less people and it's a deeper relationality and organizations are funded by you know government programs that love to talk about you know numbers of people through an exhibition and that's why you can fund that more easily but this yeah this type of work of learning together and even just like the space to think together without an outcome is really rare and I guess that's what um, I'm really interested in in this project and generally in the work I like. 
And do you just kind of um, before we move on to the next se section, do you think that the um, that working on this project has changed? I guess your 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 perception of how you proceed with a structural change project because I know you both this is part of your curatorial curatorial practice more broadly it's not the first such project and um but it might be different to something else you've done given that it is working in a regional context with a different kind of um premise like parallel is probably different to other things you've been working on yeah I mean it's really like working in a smaller arts community has really reinforced to me that, you know, the people working in an organisation are the organisation. Like in the time that we've been in Aubrey Wodonga, like, you know, staff have invited us to their homes for dinner. We've run into them on the street. Um, you know, we've met their families. Um, the staff members in the museum have really close working relationships with almost all of the artists in the area. Um, so they're not necessarily, you know, hidden away in an office, like you, you would expect the people or the, the, the perception of like people working in an institution is they're very visible within a community. And in, in saying that, like, um, yeah, it makes me think that structural change is actually relatively achievable and very responsive to, um, locality um and community if the individuals in an organization are committed to it um so that yeah that has actually been a really big positive that I've taken away from the project um and I think yeah working in a regional context has made that clear to me yeah I guess for me it it's sort of um clarifies I think that this work is all about relationality and also needs to be done collectively when we're responding to a structure which is a relational project in itself um I think there's you know because Seb and I worked on the disorganizing project together and we're in the same sort of locality we were able to have that type of dialogue that then allowed us to bring our projects together which then allowed us to bend the structure and I think the more opportunities people have to do that thinking together, the more innovative we can become with how we respond to structures. I guess it's like the same thing with the union or that sort of stuff. So I think, um, yeah, I think it um, it's not so different from disorganising in that way or working in an urban um, centre, but maybe sometimes regionally, because there's a little bit less noise and fractured stuff and there's, you know, a, a central museum that most people um, we're working with or the local artists will reference as the point, um, it can make some of those relations a little bit clearer. Um, and so I think it is a really good space to test lots of ideas around structural change because the um, networks can be traced a little bit more than in the city where there's, like, so much going on. Um, but yeah, I think it's the same thing of like relationality and people, like Seb said. This, um, thanks, Lana. Thanks, Seb. This might actually be a good um, point to continue a bit more of focus on the front and back end um, and maybe get uh, Kelly and Tian to talk to their projects. I mean, um, yeah, just for context as well, like, um, Kelly, you've got a um like a uh, exhibition that's happening in the gallery, and Tian, your project has like started uh, started and kind of um stayed within the back end processes of Mama. Um, so it might be I think that you guys will be a good kind of pair to talk to that. What um. I mean, Kelly, what have been some of the back end processes you've focused on in your project? Um, I promise I'm going to answer your question. And yeah, sure, hi, everybody. Sure. My hi. name is Kelly. <laughs> um, I'm coming from unceded Gadigal lands. Um, I'm a just a little bit about my background. I'm a creative 
producer and curator. Um, I work at the intersections of contemporary art, nightlife, and culture. Uh, I'm Haitian, uh, of Haitian background. Uh, I grew up in America, um, hence why I sound very American, but if you met any of my family, they sound deeply Caribbean. Um, uh, it all means that I'm African diasporic. And, you know, I've moved to Australia five years ago. And when I moved to Australia, I immediately um, started to grapple with what does it mean to be um, Black and of African diasporic background, living in a country with other Black folks and Black First Nations folks. So I think a lot of how I came into this was uh, with that thinking. Um, the image that you're seeing right now is a poster that's outside the um, African grocery store in Wadonga. Um, and I love the image inside uh, to the right of that is an image of some products in the grocery store. And I love that even in a store which is meant to sell like, you know, black foods and, and things specific to blackness, mm -hmm. you still found um, elements of um, whiteness, like hair relaxing products and skin lightening creams. So just how whiteness infiltrates black spaces always. So I'll start with that. Um, and to answer your question, Salote, um, about what have what have been some of the back end processes, I think a lot of my project has been my journey to um, the collection, um, to the back end, um, and just looking for um, things. Great, looking. You could go to that second slide, actually. Um, looking for myself in the museum, looking for reflections of myself. And I think that like some of these questions here are some of the thinkings that I kind of was going through that led me to the back end. So I was looking for black representations in the museum, asking myself, does the museum have black African diasporic artists and artworks? Um, looking, at, which quickly led me to actually looking at artworks that had black subjects, because I realized given the time constraints that I had uh, and how the museum um, collects works, that would be an easier thing for me to actually look at, look at works featuring black subjects. Like I could quickly look at a painting or a photograph and be like, yeah, there's a black subject. Um, and then asking, and then I started asking myself questions like, are these self-determined understandings of black identity? Um, how does the museum uh, rep uh, do, does the museum have any uh, black self-determined um, representations uh, in their artworks and collections? Um, and as I was looking at works, I quickly realized that like, oh, like maybe does the museum perpetuate black stereotypes actually? Maybe a lot of the things that I was looking at are ways that the museum continues to like uh, unconsciously perpetuate um, ideas of black identity. Um, and asking myself the question, which brought me to my exhi exhibition, does, does and can the museum help shape our understanding of the world and in particular black identity? Um, can you go to the next slide, Salote? or Veronica, or whoever's controlling the slide. Amazing. Uh, let's go to, yeah, let's go to that slide, the next one. Yeah. So these are some um, artworks that um, I found in the collection. The Sapia image is a photograph by an artist named um, Jillian Viva Gibbs. Um, uh, I really love uh, the name of this artwork. This work is called, the first one of the young uh, black girls holding the crying white baby is called Don't You Cry. And the image next to her is of uh, called Children's Nanny. Um, again, I found this in a box of images uh, that was in the collection and they're just like, it was like maybe 30 to 50 images um, that Viva Gibbs took on her trips to South Africa. Uh, I remember in conversation with folks who worked at the museum, I asked if these images had ever been shown, if these images were to be shown, like, would they ever show these images? And I guess the sentiment that I was feeling was that like, oh, maybe these images are a little bit too complicated and they hadn't figured out a way to bring them out of the back end and, and share them. Um, and I was like really um, a bit determined to like, how do I like bring these images out? How do I like almost liberate these black bodies that have been like in the museum's collection, in their store, in this box and um, bring them out 
into the um, gallery space. Uh, so those are some of the complicated images I found. Um, the image of the young black girl with her eyes upwards, that's a Shireen Fahad image that the museum has. It's called Chosen Africa. This image is part of, um, it's in a series, but this museum or this image and artwork lives in the museum's collection on its own, isolated from its series. Um, again, the title of this work is called Chosen Africa, and it's part of a series that Shireen did called The Chosen. Um, and I started to think to myself, like, what does it mean for this image to sit away from its series, like to sit on its own? What does it mean for this image to have such a big title? Like Africa is a continent that consists of lots of cultures and languages. What does it mean for this little girl to be representative, to be the chosen of an entire continent? So that was, you know, some of the things that I was grappling with thinking through. I love the image black and white image of um, to the left of the two black men. That's a Tracy Muffet image called Some Lads. You know, I think the Viva Gibbs and Shireen Fahad image uh, feel complex. I think there are good intentions there, but I think, you know, they inadvertently still push black stereotypes. And what I loved about the Tracy Muffet image was like here you had images, this image of these two black men that were soft, um caring um gentle words that i don't think people typically equate to black masculinity and i felt like oh how interesting that like this black photographer was able to get that sentiment across to give us a more nuanced understanding of like black identity i also love that brooke andrew donut um that's a a, a sculpture work that the museum has in their collection i also love the idea that like you know black people always don't want to make work about Black identity, <laughs> work featuring Black subjects. They want to make works that are dynamic and bold and, and a little bit weird as well. And I just love how, for me, Donut kind of represents that. Um, and then the image right below that, that's a uh, still from a new commission work that I um, I commissioned these two artists, an artist, Naomi Impa Museemu, who lives in Albury. Um, and Olivia Solomon, an artist from Sydney, I invited them to make a new work about like black and in particular black African diasporic uh, self-determination. Um, and this invitation was to like continue this conversation that I already saw happening in the museum's collection, like where there were works with black subjects, but they weren't um, black African diasporic subjects that weren't self-determined. And then there was work by black First Nation subjects that were self-determined. And I wanted black African diasporic people to kind of have the same opportunity to create self-determined work. Um, it's all to say that, uh, to answer your, your question, Salote, yeah, it's a big part of my process has been like, in the museum's collection and just like what grappling with the things that I found in that con collection and uh, grappling with how the museum collects black identity. Yeah, it's interesting too, because I, I think one of your initial discussions with us was about when you first came to Australia and you had to um, think about what black meant because of it, this different like cultural context. 100%. And I also should say that oftentimes when I say the word, word Black, I'm uh, saying Black spelt B-L-A-C in brackets K, which is uh, not mine, which is a term coined by these two Harvard um, University academics to talk about intersecting Black identities within the context of Australia. So Black African diasporic identities with Black First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, um, Pacific Islanders. And again, in that is a conversation about how we have different histories, but we've been impacted by colonization in similar ways. You know, we have experiences with colorism and racism, um, white supremacy, like a lot of those shared experiences. And I, uh, because I remember when we first uh, all went through a tour of um, the collection with Michael and Michael was talking about, you know, when you become in charge of a collection, you inherit like the way that other people have collected 
how you know you're in your description of self determined. Um, you've got this Tracy Moffat. Were there many others in in your like finding out about the back end of like works where um, it is a self determined maker that creates these images? Yeah, and all of the ones that I did find were Black First Nations artists. So I and I think that's why I really wanted to have this intersecting conversation about Black identity because it's to say that Mama does have Black self determined work. Um, and Mama has done a really beautiful rehangs. They have um, uh, First Nations curator, um, Andrea Briggs, who does really beautiful um, collection hangs that are like black led and, and feel and have that idea of um, black self-determination. Um, but I, it, I couldn't find that in regards to black African diasporic folks. And again, why I'm interested in Black African diasporic folks is because, you know, at the top of this conversation, we talked about how Albury has this growing um, Black, um, well, Black migrant refugee community growing. Um, yeah, so like, I wanted to, like, in thinking about like, how, why would someone from a Black migrant refugee come into the museum like I think that it would help if they saw reflections of themselves there if they knew that their work could be shown if they knew that there was space for them there and I guess that's what I was trying to like crack open uh in uh our earliest uh and we mentioned it earlier Veronica and I that session that we had um in introducing people to the back end as well as the front end of the museum that was we did ask people what it is they wanted to um that see in the museum or what they want how they wanted to connect with the museum and that was very much a part of it that um like seeing themselves self-represented but also actually as makers the people who were with us that were makers like to connect to um the to all greater Aubrey through like their own kind of like representing themselves and culture through like workshops and things like that Totally. You know, I think that also part of uh, when I was thinking about inviting uh, Black artists from um, Albury to come and do a new commission, one of the questions that I got was like, uh, one of the questions I asked were like, oh, are there any Black artists like who would be like museum ready to like participate in this? And there was a, like, there was an unknowing, there were uh, people were, weren't sure. Uh, who and it made me start to think of black art forms that maybe weren't recognized right and I think that uh, I had conversations with folks and it led me to find um, Naomi who was like the local black hair braider and I started to think of like hair and hair braiding and and that black art form that doesn't necessarily get recognized and I think that's was Naomi's entry point into this project. Great and um, were, were, what were the kind of challenges of then bringing Naomi to work within this project, within the, mm -hmm. the gallery context? Well, I mean, I think Naomi has never worked in the context of a museum or arts institution. Naomi probably still struggles to seeing herself as an artist. Every time I say she's an artist, she kind of pushes back against that. Um, but again, I think for me, this project has been an exercise in Black dreaming and giving Black people the opportunity to dream, giving Black people the opportunity to like imagine different futures, which is an exercise I think Black people don't oftentimes get to do. Yeah. Would, would you say, though, that um, maybe uh, if we looked at it from the other side, like the museum um, does want to hear like and see like you know you've had like a good reception I sh um to this the ideas around this project project um so really it it is a thing about self perception would you say that or from Naomi's point of view maybe or what do you can um, you elaborate a little bit more yeah and I realize I'm sort of getting myself into a hole the way that I say that I think I think there's like um like it's a like good time that to have your project and you particular make this project at the at the museum 
Um, and I can see also this, uh, like in relation to Sam and Lana's project too, is like expanding on what can be seen as um, art and culture within the museum um, on, on its own terms as a project rather than as like just viewing from the, I guess, the white outside. Um, I guess I, like Veronica, have less of a question there than a, maybe a statement of seeing like that. Like, like it's great that, like, you did have to find, okay, where am I going to find, um, a, like, a project and actually seeing, like, knowing and seeing culture was really a part of that, mm. developing that, like, front end and back end. Once again, not a question. Um. <laughs> Happens to all of us, Salati. Um, so um, maybe just to kind of um, move on to Tian and have time for questions. That's all right. Yep. So uh, Tian, thanks a lot for that, Kelly, as well, um, and everyone who's spoken so far. Tian, um, your projects kind of uh, started in the back end and kind of stayed there. Can you um, kind of uh, talk to uh, your journey there? Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Tian and I'm calling from Darry country, from Par um, yeah, from the land of the Barometical. Um, So my project, um, I guess the framing of it, um, I'm very, the way that I work is very process led and so, the process that I wanted to bring in was related to this text that I wrote last year, um, A Manifesto for Radical Care or How to Be a Human in the Arts. And that text, I guess, was sort of bringing together a lot of my thinking around care within institutions or just, I guess, care within the arts sector, which relates to institutions. Um, and so, um, I guess the, there were sort of two sort of parts of that. Um, one was as part of my research week, I invited members um, of staff across a cross section of the staff, including the senior team and um, I guess, you know, casually employed um, visitor services staff um, and everyone in between um, to enter into a reading group um, around the text. And so we read the text um, and we um, had a very open discussion around what that sort of prompted. Um, sorry, can you go back? Um, and so the the five points of, of the text um, uh, set and respect boundaries, invest in the personal, change can happen within the microcosm, sharing is caring and growing in interdependently. Um, in the process of that reading, um, there were things that emerged that then sort of then pointed me towards maybe areas of structural change that I was interested in, which related to care. Um, and I think um, particularly care around um, the most precarious workers in the organization and the most marginalized. Um, and there was sort of an, an intersection of that where there were um, host uh, visitor services um, staff who were casuals and a lot of them were um, culturally and linguistically diverse and um, who are interfacing with, I guess, a predominantly white audience um, or, or perhaps were, um, yeah, having sort of challenging sort of situations um, relating to audience engagement um, and and I guess conflicts within their role as within their role and then themselves as a person. Um, and so that's what I was really interested in sort of thinking about because that was the, I guess, the challenge that was presented during that research time. Is it um, right if I um, just quickly ask you, because the very first part of your project was like everyone talking about like reading the manifesto together and I think this is maybe something that people don't have to do as an experience in their workplace in that way how did you how did how did that go like how did you perceive people's responses to sitting in a room and reading 
the manifesto together if I may ask sorry I cut in but sure um I mean I think um depending on what sort of uh, what your role was within the organization this was either very familiar or very unfamiliar and so I think there was a range of responses from people um but it, just in general I think everyone was very open everyone was very interested and very generous in what they shared um and it was really an honor to actually hold that space for the staff to talk about these some of these things I guess in a way that maybe is different to a team meeting which is might be very um I don't know like sort of pro like goal or goal oriented or project task focused yeah. or pro yeah project focused so I think it it created this space for and obviously I think um you know, I, I think that some of the things that were mentioned, um, you know, people knew that there were these areas that perhaps needed to be addressed. But again, I think there was also um, some surprise as well as to the extent of them, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, this is just sort of, and you know, and I, I don't want to go too much into it because the, the content of what was shared, um, you know, remains confidential. Um, but, you know, it was, I guess, a space for the team to, well, the, the whole organisation to really understand, um, I guess, each other um, through the lens of reading about care. <laughs> did you um, did you feel the impact of, like, because it's been mentioned a few times, I think V and I mentioned it earlier too, is, like, that fly-in kind of thing, like, you know, coming in from the outside, and asking people to participate in something is a little different to like, you know, that building of relationships, I think is initially um, like, you don't know what it's going to be like, you know, until. Yeah, you know, definitely. Before. I mean, I think what's interesting with this is uh, I, I mean, I've, I've worked in sort of like both as a curator, but also in community engagement sort of projects Um that's sort of where I started working in the arts is within sort of community and cultural development. And what I was actually doing is, um, you know, a community engagement process, but not with a community as you would sort of normally think about it, but actually with thinking about the organization as a community and thinking and and thinking and, and applying, I guess, those processes that I've learned in, in other projects and other work to the organization itself. And that's where I wanted to start. And that's where I, and I knew that that's where I wanted to work um, because also because I knew that, you know, other fellows were addressing different areas, working with different parts of, you know, um, I guess the external facing community. And I really wanted to, to, to look at what was happening internally, um, particularly because I just, you know, written this text that really was focusing on um, people within, I guess, or either working within or working with, um, institutions and and how care is enacted in different situations and for different people and how that's um, essentially unequal um, and so I guess the um, the process then um, after that research week was I wanted to follow the these steps as well in my process um, and so uh, in my proposal for my project I outlined how I would work through each of these five things in um, a proposed project. Um, at that point, the project I think that I proposed was to work with um, the culturally and linguistically diverse members of staff, uh, and particularly with the visitor services team um, to create some sort of publication or to, uh, to run a few workshops with um, those members of staff to create a publication um, that I guess would in some way highlight some of the things that were spoken about um, without, I guess, yeah, I with I guess without um, it becoming too personal for them um, to be able to talk about it and to to think about some of these things in in a way that was, you know, not yeah couldn't be fully identified as as particular incidents, but but talking about um, what their visions for a better museum might be or what their visions for what they might want a museum to be from their perspective. And this is from the perspective that I, from, you know, of the most, I would say, the precarious staff involved, um, which I think is really important always to hear from um, those who have, I guess, the least institutional power. 
Um, I guess through the process of that, um, in terms of like enacting step one, which is set and respect boundaries, um, I asked for Mama to undergo cultural safety training because um, I felt that that was um, a bit of a gap um, and something that they could embark on while I was doing this work. Um, and that would help, um, you know, the, the staff who had sort of, you know, shared um, various things that had happened to them and also for all of us as the fellows, as all, you know, we were all chosen because we were culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, we were coming into an organization where, you know, like the, the leadership is not entirely white, but is predominantly white and is the same, I think, across a lot of regional um, museums or just museums in general. So that was something that I requested um, and that I felt would provide safety for working through the rest of the project um and I guess it's um, been a bit of an impact on the the back end of your projects too because there are like um like uh there was this recognition of a um a gap and so there is like you know the museum rather than have an outward facing project it's sort of like in relation to cultural change, it has affected the way your project has affected the way that the back end um will like work. So there are um, you know, they are working towards um well, they do have like um programs of care that relate to other programs that I think one that came from UQ. Verona, could you remember the there's like been like an adaptation uh, based UQ, on the yeah. UQ, sorry, AQ. What's AQ? <laughs> That's not even doesn't exist. It's open for other people to take if they want Art Queensland. Um, so yeah, so there's sort of just been this kind of like, um, so so we don't see like a kind of a physical response in in the form of an exhibition or a, a public program with what you've done. With like it's all happening sort of in there in the back end. Well, I guess it initially, like I wanted to, like I needed to do the back end work needs to be done in order to support the front end work. Um, you know, the front end work on its own is actually performative. Um, and so the back end work needs to be done in order for that to, to be holistic. And that was the reason that I also wrote this text as well, is because I was really, felt really challenged by um, what I was seeing was a lot of front end work that wasn't sort of, uh, where the back end work wasn't sort of, in my opinion, being carried out. I mean, I, it was amazing that Mama um, stepped up to the challenge and embarked on cultural safety training and um, and ways to, I guess, yeah, and and to acknowledge as well that you know these problems were not sort of new to them and they were already working through some of these things, but it was just sort of yeah. Um, like I, I needed certain things to be in place before I could do anything that was front end. Um, and to me, a big part of that was the cultural safety training, which they have um, embarked on, which is incredible. Um, and so, you know, then I guess as, as a result of that, um, I mean, I was still really invested in making, um, in working with um, the visitor service, services team with the marginalized staff. Um, but, you know, through conversations with Parallel, um, it was sort of, you know, deemed that, that there, was, there wasn't enough time um, to be able to follow through with um, my initial idea. Um, there was a lot of back and forth about, um, you know, I, I had other proposals of ways to adapt that in order to still have to, you know, I guess to still be able to do the fun bit, which for me was working with um, the, you know, yeah, working with the people that I wanted to work with. Um, but, I guess... you know, that never, yeah, it, it never eventuated. And so, um, I, yeah, I guess it's just a, a challenge, um, you know, working within these things, trying to do structural changes, you know, so, so much can happen, but then there are still these other structures of deadlines and time and funding and, and all of this stuff, which, you know, I guess um, we're all still constrained by as well. 
I mean, it definitely is a complex um, balance. I think maybe in relation to also that stuff that you were talking about, the casual kind of stuff that uh, uh, um, that actually that also is a moving piece, like the same stuff that maybe you initially worked with had moved on to do other things as well. Like there's just a lot of um, moving pieces within an um within institutional spaces um and uh yeah i think it is tr uh, like it is true i think the balance out of um the back end makes the front end like um more of a easy place for all people to work in including like people of color like myself i would say um that uh, I really, and just reiterate something from earlier on, and maybe Veronica, you uh, agree, like a really important part of like asking um, Mama to be a part of this parallel project was that when we first worked with them, there was this recognition that they were already in this state of um, change and in this state of like looking to um, develop their structures um, and they're also an organisation that sits within a council. So they have structures that also are related to structures that ex exist within the um, uh, count, like the council, the Aubrey Council, which does mean that uh, uh, that is a huge impact on the back end of um, how that place runs. Yeah, yeah and also that... just, oh, sorry, go Tian. No, go for it. Oh, I was going to say, and um, it's also going back to what Callie and, and Jenny were saying um, that they've, that Mama has inherited a whole bunch of structures, but also collections, items, policies, um, ways of working. And it's very hard to unpack that. And I think that. Um, yeah, like that we all in different ways try and negotiate the histories of the institutions in which we work. And and I think one of the, um, yeah, like, I mean, maybe we can head into question time um, and I'll, uh, through this segue, but one of the interesting things of Parallel is um, the, the points of, of difference. And, um, you know, it's definitely a conversational project, but we're all coming at, at this idea, this very broad, sometimes very abstract, but I think very urgent and necessarily material idea of structural change from different positions. And I think that we, we all need to remember that we will, in that process, having I have to work with a, a ton of history, our own histories, but also that of the institution. So um, I'm trying to create a segue. I know, but I'm sorry, I just made me think of one thing, like even within the yeah. time period that we started working with Mama from that first kind of like experimental kind of project to now, we've seen them like make all a lot of changes in the way that they, in the back end and in the front end, not just through staff and um, like processes in the back end, but also like how they connect to the community. And so actually mm. in a way like, and like it, as an example is maybe um, the dismantling of the Friends of the Gallery to then become a different organisation that was opened up to like more members of the community, say that's an example, but um, like to, to, and so I do feel like parallel as a conversational and experimental kind of research project fits within like what fits or extends and runs alongside them as an organisation in, in in something they were already, like, working towards. And actually it's um, the strength of and those we'll continue. is so powerful. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll continue, continue to work to towards. when we're gone, yeah. Yeah. Um, but and I think those, maybe just, one of the interesting ideas is that maybe in the, you know, we've talked about how, um, we started working with Mama in 2016 and 
you know, uh, Sophie, I think, started working, Sophie Holfus in engagement, started working with Mama maybe 2017. I can't quite remember, Sophie. Um, Annie, I think you were already there. But, you know, Nanette started in 2019, I think it was. Um, my point being that in that period when Mama has intentionally um, recruited and implemented ways of um, enacting structural change that exceed parallel. I think maybe parallel has become a bit redundant or will become redundant shortly after it finishes anyway, since that mum is already trying to pursue these ideas as well, just as a provocation. Um, shall we say we now? aside too, like Sophie took us on our first tour of um, Bonagilla. She did, when she worked at Bonagilla. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have some questions in the chat. Um, maybe we can start, but Jasmine, you had a question. I don't know if you're still here, if you want to unmute and ask that question. Hello, everyone. It's Jasmine here. Can you hear me? Yep. We yes. can see Jasmine. Well, if you look in the chat, uh, my question was about the term regional. Uh, just wondering the kinds of meanings around regional that all the participants came to the project with because for as long as MAMA and its uh, in institutional predecessors have existed, there's been this term regional gallery. And thinking about new meanings and understandings of the term regional that have emerged over the last year and a half, and um, I just want to acknowledge Seven Lana, who, who actually um, have reflected about those issues, but just wondering if other people, the fellows or Salotti or Veronica, would like to add something. I guess those borders keep changing, don't they, Jasmine? I mean, uh, Campbelltown Art Centre used to be a regional gallery, didn't it? That's what I think of immediately when you talk to that. Anyone else? I'll just, I just, um, <clears throat> I approach regional as not antithetic to the metropole or like the space that I was working in and not assuming that it was just this kind of reversal of, of structures or, or things were just kind of a, a mirrored sort of image or completely different because there are a lot of things that, um, uh, extend and exist within the regional spaces, but are also completely different um, in ways that I never would have imagined. And and this is where I really relied on on the Mama staff and Lynette and Sophie in particular in that initial um, R and D week that I was on to kind of guide me through that. And I also had to just sit in the space and and learn what regional meant and what it meant to the people there and the stakeholders there. But that was just one thing that I had to um, I approach the project with was not thinking about it as antithetical to um, to anything as its own distinct um, category, space. Any of the other fellows? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll add that after that first R&D week, we had lots of conversations about what it means to be from a place. And it was, um, I, I was uh, surprised to find that even a lot of the folks who uh, live and work in Mama still hesitate, or excuse me, in Albury, still hesitated to say that they were from Albury. So what does it mean to be from a region? Is anyone from a region? Um, and it, for me, I, stood, I started to understand um, uh, a regional museum or a regional space as something that was nimble something that was in flux and and that could take on change maybe a lot quicker than um a, a museum situated in a city and it, which is what made made it make sense for us to be working at mama in albury i guess for me um i just approach things from an understanding of place rather than i guess these terms that I guess, yeah, I mean, in answering your question, I don't really have an understanding of what regional means and I maybe still don't. Um, you know, I I was able to spend time in Albury and in Mama. Um, and, 
and think about that, you know, both that organization, those communities, that place, and, you know, the resources that flow through, the people that flow through, like all of these things, which, you know, I guess um, varies from place to place, whether, yeah, you know, and I guess there's like different e economics um, around that, which which is why, you know, I guess these categorizations start. But I always feel quite challenged by them because I live and work in Western Sydney and Western Sydney is also so diverse, even though it's, you know, like, um, sort of framed as, as this, you know, like entity. Um, and so in the same way, I feel like regional is very different as well, wherever you are. And, and really it's just, it was about understanding that particular place rather than understanding the regional. Yeah, um, I, um, does anyone else have a question? I, I, otherwise I can add. Um, did anyone, did you want to, were you answering a question, Jenny, with that point in the chat? No. Do you want to speak to it? No? Okay. Maybe, maybe um, later, I'm not sure if this is a... No, I think, Jenny, that, that was, uh, I think, uh, thanks for adding that to the chat. I think, you know, for someone who wasn't um, brought up in the context of Australia, um, when I saw the term CALD, I really um, uh, struggled to understand what it meant in the context of this um, uh, fellowship and um, and who would, uh, the fellowship would be open to. Um, so I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. And like in unpacking terms, I think a term that we were all really... Um, uh, like trying to digest was the term CALD and how how we all sat within that particular identity. Um, maybe some of the fellows want to talk to that. I'll just say, I don't think we need to digest the term. We can refuse it. <laughs> and no, please. Um, we don't but yeah, it's when a, we're picking a box. <laughs> it's a funding category, yeah. I think. I mean, that's that's that is it's a, it's a it's a data collection and funding category set by the Australian federal government, but not not a term that's I think flexible enough to speak to different positionalities, especially in this project. Um, mm. Does does anyone else have a question? Thanks, Philip. What is the role of the public or the audience in in parallel in par parallel projects? Ooh. Do you want me to speak to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was so just Philip, wondering. Yes. Do you want to just introduce yourself? Oh yes, I'm uh, I'm Philip Maher. I'm um Part of the research team, in a sense, but a little bit uh, separate from um, from um, you guys, because we're kind of evaluating the program um, sort of a bit independently. But I was just wondering about um, this question because, you know, things that are exhibited um, and uh, the the public programs and stuff. How how is the audience and those public communities? Um, they're they're a kind of third space in relation to this parallel, and then there's Mama, the the internal, the staff and the the sort of whole web of what that institution is, and then how do you envisage the audience and the public's um, uh, kind, kind of being active in this process um, and affecting the process, the parallel process? I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts. 
I mean, for me, thinking about our project at the farm, audience was like a big part of, I guess, the, the thinking behind the project because in, um, I guess, Mama has exhibitions that often will come from Sydney or like big interstate or, yeah, national artists and they're typically not like their openings aren't as well attended as the local artists. There's a really big pool for you know, the communities that exist within um, Aubrey Wodonga. And I think part of what I was interested in in sort of um, merging a project with Seb because he was working with those local artists was to bring those communities together because it was really clear that um, the farm, which exists on Crown land as a pretty, um, I guess, yeah, it's not like a very... Uh, concrete project that couldn't shift easily and it, it, it finds it quite hard to get funding and it sort of is in a place where it needs that community support and community attention and I think those local mm. artists will bring that to um, this project but also yeah I think it was about those connections that the local artists bring and bringing them to also the farm which is also speaking to the dynamic of um, Aubrey Wodonga as a refugee resettlement area and, you know, what sort of role does the museum play in that space? I think for me, um, it's an interesting question because for me, the public and the audience isn't actually a part of it at all. Um, I would love to think about ways in which a public and audience is part of that but then also at the same time, I guess there's, you know, levels of safety and, you know, that sort of thing that also needs to be considered when you are sharing things um, and especially when you are working in the back end. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, so I'm distracted. Uh, yeah, so I think actually the audience doesn't need necessarily need to be part of it. Uh, especially if we are talking about structural change, like what isn't what is the audience for structural change? Actually, is it all of us? You know, is it is it actually um, other practitioners who are most interested in this? Um, do do the general public even care? <laughs> you know, um, I think these are all questions that I think I've been grappling with with this project. Uh. Yeah, I guess the audience it would see uh, one side of it. That is the aesthetics of the response, and would that that's an interesting thing. Apart from you know the actual questions the works raise, you know, so particularly say with Kelly's uh, project, you know, uh, just just how those publics might be part of that sort of change that that uh, everyone's talking about, you know. I think the interesting thing about local government is that it's very inclusive. And when you talk to the staff, uh, yeah, the, the museum is for everybody and that's kind of, that's why I think there's an important question. But anyway... Uh Quick note to that to your to your question, Philip. Um, the whole commission that Keg and I are working on is shaped by a local stakeholder. I I don't like use the the term audience so much because I, I want to conceive of everyone as quite active agents, yada yada. But um, yeah. <clears throat> the the whole intention of, of the commission was to have it shaped in consultation with um, yeah, local stakeholders, and and that's what we've done. So we're working with um, this incredible woman called Aruna and yeah. everything is built around her. So without without her, this project wouldn't exist. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, no, I just I'm just thinking of the sort of the front end when when people see your work and, and how they respond, how, how that can be will that be folded into anything? Will it be sort of a process at that point of when the when the programs are rolled out and 
And what will that mean for the continuity of the structural change in the future? You know, because things will be presented around that. And anyway, I don't know. It's a general question, I guess, that maybe doesn't have a clear answer like, like many of the questions. Um, thanks, thanks, Bianca, um, for your comment too, and Philip, um, for your always insightful comments. Um, I feel like it's probably time to wrap up. It's two minutes to midnight, where I am at, oh, yeah. and um, so unless anyone's got questions, perhaps we should do that. Slotty's got Stuart, who's causing some fart problems. That was a personal <laughs> message, Veronica. <laughs> um, but I did want to um, just thank everyone. I think all the kind of the differences in the projects, the um, I've just lost my words. I think it's because I got a fart right to the brain, but um. <laughs> There's just like a lot of insight into working within the structures that have come from these projects, not only because of uh, the, you know, the great thinkers and uh, developers that we've got in our fellows, but also just because, um, you know, uh, stru structures have so many levels to them and there's so many... Um, insights to uh, be made but I just wanted to say I just really appreciate that our, our fellows have really kind of worked towards um, like acknowledging that they come from elsewhere in to kind of create these connections within not only the organization of MAMA but also like with the community and the projects that they've developed. Sorry I get a bit huggy at the moment, I don't know what's happening, but I mean it. It's nice. We love you too, Salati. Um, so Bianca, maybe we'll let you just call it a day. Yeah, I just want to extend that um, sentiment. Uh, thanks so much for the, there's just so much um, nuanced, careful work being done and um. I really, I can see how this can be taken up and applied in a range of ways, obviously depending on the specific contexts in, in, across institutions, but there's just so many strategies that have been offered through this careful work um, and really appreciate you sharing this uh, and the insights that you've gained. Um, it's just such urgent work and uh, wishing you best, all the best with how that carries forward in the next couple of months heading to the, so the public outcomes, is that right, in, in March? Uh, no, the public outcomes launch October 20th. Okay, this year. With, um, yeah, with Kelly. <laughs> Kelly's the first exhibition, followed by um, Evgenia and Keg um, November 3, and then um, Bruja February um, 3, and then Seven Lana in March. and. We'll also run like a public program, symposium, workshop, event um, in February 5 to 6 where um, people can come and hear the fellows on site, including um, Seven Line at the Farm is the plan and Tian, we're thinking maybe you can speak there to your project too. Um, and But we'll be launching all of that information soon. We can have so, these networks as well. Yeah, and I also just briefly just wanted to thank um, some of our collaborators, not uh, Runway Journal, um, who I mentioned at the start, but also Ying Lang Dan, who is working with us as an architect and exhibition designer to draw out some of the ideas of how do you visualise ideas of, of structural change um, in exhibition and public program format and Philip Ma and Ian Ang, who's not here from Western Sydney, and of course, um, Sophie and Annie from Mama who are here, but all the Mama staff as well. And thanks to, so Keg, I mean, this is a lot of people to thank. And <laughs> now I'm getting emotional. <laughs>
Because it's midnight you where you are. It's midnight. <laughs> My jeans finished. And you miss us, you miss us too much, right? Yeah, I miss you all. And thanks to all my beautiful colleagues for coming as well um, to hear the fellows. And Salotti and I ask questions and non-questions. Very appreciated. We're great at the um, non-questions. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, yes, well, thank you very much. And thank you to all the fellows, Seb, Lana, Ruha in the van, Tian, and Jenny and Kelly, you've all been wonderful. So thanks. Big hug. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.